Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Joint Cardiology and General Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, we're welcome to folks online, especially colleagues from Hospital Medicine and General Medicine. It is a great honor to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Domingo, who is our 2023 Smith Center Visiting Professor. Dr. Domingo, as you all know, is a renowned cardiovascular epidemiologist whose work over the last two decades has really shaped how we think about cardiovascular prevention and treatment from a public health perspective and a population perspective. Um, she started her career at Princeton, uh, undergrad in molecular biology, um, went on to get a degree in chemistry from the University of Illinois in Nigeria, and then she arrived at the University of California at San Francisco, and true to the acronym UCSF, you can stay forever. <laughs> there, a PhD in biochemistry, medical school, internship, residency, fellowship in internal medicine, and master's in epidemiology before she joined the doctor. I think it, it, one of her most remarkable achievements with UCSF was the establishment of the Center for Vulnerable Populations. Many of us have had the privilege of working there, where it's a center that focuses on the needs of underserved populations. Such as folks who are experiencing homelessness, uh, food insecurity, and health, a limited health literacy. She went on to be the chair of FBN Biostats, um, the, and the inaugural vice dean for population health equity. She, uh, and then when the pandemic hit, she basically led UCSF's public health initiative to ensure that communities of color have access to medicine. And while she was doing all this at UCSF, she was also leading the national debate on how to improve health care. She was she served on and then presided over the uh, influential United States Coronavirus Services Task Force for I think a major contribution was to make sure that the recommendations were transparent and accessible. She got elected to the National Academies of Medicine, uh, the and more recently the American Association of Data. And just really thought she had done it all in 2022. She took on the role as editor in chief at uh, JAMA, which is a network of 13 very influential peer reviewed journals. And even in the short time that she's been there, she's made major changes at JAMA, including committing to make all research publicly available the day it's published. And that's pretty remarkable if you know what's going on in the, in the, in the journal space. I will say that during all of this, um, what's really important, uh, or has been important to Pearson, and a lot of us have benefited from, is her commitment to mentorship at all stages of training, from the like, college students looking, actually high school students looking to get their first experience in science, to junior faculty and mid career faculty looking to advance the careers. Um, I, I would suffice to say that we're all really fortunate that Pearson is at the helm of one of the preeminent journals during this time of change and where how we consume science is changing. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the magic. Kristen, welcome. It was a very nice introduction, and uh, I hope I can live up to that. Um, but uh, thank you all for having me. Um, we had a wonderful night at dinner last night. Um, at 8 a.m. this morning, <laughs> but I'm really thrilled to be here and um, have visited the ID before. So uh, this is really quite a lovely opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to talk about medical journals. Now I've been the editor in chief for <coughs> nine months, so I don't know that much about this topic. Uh, but it has been uh, it's been amazing to be part of. Um, a, a sort of very interesting dynamic time for medicine, for science, and to work then in a sector that I knew nothing about, but um, but had thought a lot about being the outsider, the author trying to get into JAMA, the reader trying to read JAMA, and um, and so I uh, I have I have a lot of thoughts on this topic, and that's what I hope to share with you, but mostly to engage with you in a discussion on some of these topics. So um, I don't have any. Oh, yeah, I don't have any disclosures other than that. I am the editor of Jamma. Um, just to remind you um, of what Jamma is, um, so uh, you probably know much of this uh, in terms of uh, its reach. Jamma is 140 years old this year. Um, but we we're published by uh, the American Medical Association, but have a firewall from the American Medical Association, so we're uh, independent in our editorial uh, decisions and control. JAMA is the uh, uh, 
uh, lead journal of a network of 13 journals, 11 specialty journals, and an open access journal, Health, uh, JAMA Health Forum is our newest one, which is also an open access journal. Um, and it's really quite an extraordinary reach of this platform. Um, and, uh, and I think when I took, uh, when I took, decided to take this job, I, um, it was both uh, the strength of JAMA and the opportunity to think across this really broad platform for communicating about science and health. Of course, I don't do all the work across the network. Each of these journals are led by really um, phenomenal uh, thought leaders in their fields. Um, and uh, they benefit from a common infrastructure that is the network, um, and uh, but make their independent editorial decisions. And, and we work collectively as a network to make sure that uh, top papers sort of stay within the network. Uh, and our newest editor in chief is uh, Dr. Sharon Inouye from um, Dr. Sharon Inouye, who's uh, replacing Rita Redberg. Um, who led Jana internal medicine for 14 years and who will be celebrating uh, all of her accomplishments and then welcoming Sharon in July. So I took this over and I'm nine months in and uh, I forgot to say I've never, well, I've never been an editor. I've never been an associate editor. I've never been a baby editor. I've never been a consulting editor. And so, um, and so the question was, why would I take this job? And I think for, for many people, the pandemic was a disruptive time, right? And for, as Kazi said, for me, I went from doing cardiovascular disease research to this big infectious disease pandemic and recognizing I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist. I was like, well, I'm just going to go to clinic, back up the residents who are all in the hospital and do that. And very quickly, though, then shifted the science that I was doing um, to start to ask and answer some questions in the pandemic that were of policy relevance. And then worked a lot on um, making sure that how we translated our scientific findings into action, especially in communities who were uh, not being served in the same way, um, that we could do that at least locally and throughout the state. And so that was a very important time for me, um, as was um, recognizing the importance of science communication. So I remember the first few weeks of the pandemic, the first few months, seeing lots of great people on TV communicating about the pandemic and then realizing, well, most of them were men. Most of them did not have an experience related to infectious disease or pandemics or anything or policy or anything else. And I was like, well, I could at least be as good as they're going to be. <laughs> so I might as well lean in a little bit more uh, to what was going on here. And then realizing that uh, just how important we do all of this great science, we do think about communication in the clinical context, but thinking about the impact of communication more broadly um, and having the impact that scales um, it is really it is really important. And so when the opportunity came up to think about this, it was sort of intriguing to me. And I think the thing that made it that clear is that, um, you know, I think the pandemic taught us a lot about what was powerful with science. You know, we have fantastic vaccines, fantastic diagnostics, but we also have lots of things that we didn't learn about quickly enough. We didn't quite have the research infrastructure in place to ask the questions we really needed in more real time. Other countries were a little bit better at that. So science is sort of a win, but then also lots that we could have done better. We, trans we had great scientific findings that didn't always translate to improvements in health in the clinic or in the population health studies. Um, we had a rise of mistrust in science. Um, and uh, this is all happening at around the same time. And since journals, uh, because of their role in communicating, both vetting science and communicating about science to a broad audience, are sort of at the nexus of all of these things, it seemed like there was a real opportunity to think about what journals and a strong network of journals like the Gemma Network could do it. So that's what, uh, uh, it was both the time, the need to do more, and then sort of intriguing to learn about a sector that I didn't know anything about, but is so important to the work that we all do. And I will say, I do think the perspective of an author and a reader is a, not a bad perspective to bring to a, a set of journals like this and when we're all thinking about what we need to do a little bit better. So, um, you know, we're living in a very dynamic time for how we consume information, um, for uh, the issues that are facing us as clinicians, 
Um, and uh, all of these are trends and pressures that are shaping medical publishing, just like they're shaping ac academic medicine. And the question is, how do we as a traditional journal respond to all these things in a way that's in tune with how our authors and our readers are also experiencing it, as well as how the actual industry of medical publishing is experiencing it. And I think that's, it is this dynamic time, this rapidly changing time that I think is both the opportunity and the challenge. So I'm going to talk about three issues facing medical journals in this context. Uh, the first is uh, the real need for rapid and broad dissemination of science. We need information more quickly and we need more people to have it. How do we accomplish that? There's the issue of trust in science and trust about science. Um, uh, and it's against this backdrop that we also have to think when we do things fast, how do we do things in a way that people trust what they're getting? And then just a reflection of the broader reevaluation of all parts of academia, uh, science, and the medical enterprise, and that uh, medical publishing sitting in the middle of all of this is also a part of all of this reevaluation. So let me talk first about the rapid and broad dissemination of scientific findings. This is my subtitle what traditional journals learned about preprints and open access. So I would say before, um, before the pandemic, if you went into the traditional journals, they mostly had this view that preprints were only bad um, and that, uh, that you, were, you were dismissing the power of peer review, um, you were dismissing all of the things that we do to make um, a, scientific, <laughs> a, a, a manuscript better in the process of peer and editorial review. And that preprints were just, this is sort of an anathema to this entire process. Um, I think what the pandemic taught us, though, of course, is that, is that uh, sometimes you have to get things out quickly and that there's value to doing it. And missing the timing is important. I had the experience during the pandemic that I published my first paper on a preprint server. And it was a research, uh, one of our research scientists who was the first author on the paper. We were writing about occupational health during the pandemic, at risk of essential workers. And he called me up Sunday night and he said, I'm posting this on the free print server tomorrow. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, we had done a lot of work. We knew this was a good paper. We were gonna, he says, he says the state is debating how we're gonna roll out vaccines. And if we don't get this out now, we're gonna miss the opportunity to sort of shift that conversation to prioritize essential workers. And so I was like, okay. And so he posted it, it ended up being, uh, you know, having quite a bit of impact uh, because it was picked up, it was picked up on social channels, it ended up being very influential in California in the debate, um, and they reprioritized some of the agriculture and, um, and food uh, workers in California for vaccine access. And then this and the series of papers that followed ended up being cited in the Supreme Court ruling about occupational uh, health and, uh, and the role of, um, of occupations and what one could do in a public health, in a public health emergency in terms of occupational risk. So this, this is all great science, but mostly it was great science done in a timely way <laughs> to influence the policy. And um, now the flip side, of course, I'm a big defender of the peer review and the editorial process. And I, what I hear from my colleagues is you all, peer review journals, have to be quicker. Like things have to be quicker. And we have to uh, understand that there is a pace in which decision, make, decision making is happening. And if we miss that, um, then we're, we're sort of not doing the job that we have. And I would say, you know, as much as um, uh, traditional journals have wrung their hands about preprints, the reality, what we know, of course, is that companies just do press releases, right? They release their information out because they're capturing the moment that they have to get information out there. And so we have to do a little bit of that same thing. The issue with open access, of course, is the idea about broad access, that if we have a scientific finding, it's sort of an anathema to basic scientific principles that we should just keep it to ourselves or keep it to people who buy our journals. And, and it would be better for uh, the broad dissemination, scientists who want to do other experiments, clinicians who want to translate this into health, for more people to have access. So the question is, at, at their core, while each of these have been sort of the bane of traditional journals' existence, at their core, these are about doing things a little bit more quickly 
and making more people having letting more people have access. And the question is, how can we embrace that within valid understanding that there is a value in the traditional peer and editorial review process, which I deeply believe there is. This is what we launched earlier this year is a relaunching of JAMA Express. And this is a pathway to um, uh, bring uh, manuscripts to publication who are accepted into this pathway to publication within four weeks of submission. This is something for those late breaking studies that are going to be presented at major meetings. It is also for uh, findings of uh, clinical or public health importance where there's a time element to this. In addition to launching this specific pathway, we've tried to adjust our editorial process to, uh, to recognize that there is a value both to authors and to readers to having things uh, come out um, in a timely way without compromising our, uh, our standards for peer and editorial review. This was, we launched this so two months ago. The first set of things that came through were actually um, this that ended up being published in JAMA Ophthalmology, uh, which is about this multidrug uh, pseudomonas that is associated with artificial tear use. These ended up being the first peer reviewed uh, uh, case reports of this as the CDC was reporting already deaths from pseudomonas associated with artificial tears. Um, and so, you know, so this is just an example um, of, of the types of things that have come through and I think will be important. Uh, it's gross. Nobody can see why. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, uh, of course, most of the things that we do in this regard have to do with, with meetings. And so these are just from the, the meetings in March, the intense care meetings in Europe, uh, sort of the simultaneous publications uh, that, that happened there, including very nice um, editorial that were published, as you will recognize these authors. Um, and then um, at the ACC meeting, uh, sort of having the publications that happen simultaneous uh, to the meeting, and of course you'll recognize these authors as well. Um, so this is an important part of the process. It's very interesting to me how meetings have, uh, we're back to meeting in person, and meetings I still, I, I think still do play a very important role because the entire field is sort of, uh, even if they're not physically there at a meeting, are sort of engaged at that time, and I think that that is still a major way in which we, uh, that, that timing ends up being important for dissemination for all of those Now, let's talk about accessible science. So um, we, from, from the time that I started as, as the editor, um, we spoke with the publishers who were already thinking about how we would do this issue. Um, we, there was a lot of pressure uh, for making journals open access. Um, and uh, we decided that what we would do was to take a decision in December, we were the first major medical journal to make this decision, that an author may deposit an accepted manuscript into a public repository on the day the article is published in JAMA. It's not the pretty formatted, all my graphic artists made the nice figures paper, it's the, it's the accepted manuscript. But the idea is that, um, that these manuscripts are in public repositories and available uh, to then uh, not just people who have access. So the effect size of that trial you did, somebody can find that and, and do the next experiment that they want to, want to do. This is a, a policy that's often called green open access. Um, and it's very similar to what the NIH then subsequently announced in February as being their policy for, um, for all NIH funded research. This is still a draft policy. It's open for public comment and the NIH I think is likely to adopt this as being the requirement for all NIH funded research. Um, one of the points that we thought was important here was not just the availability of science, but that one of the things that's missed in the open access conversation is that it's focused very much on equitable access to read and we all know that the fees associated with open access oftentimes create barriers to equitable access to publishing. And I think this is something that actually ends up accomplishing uh, both, we think. Um, it's still, um, I would say, um, there, are, there, there are strongly held opinions <laughs> on both sides of this issue among the, the journals of whether this is a good idea. So we can talk about that if we want to. So I want to turn now a little bit to, I think, a bigger issue that is, so I've talked a lot about what we are doing in publishing, but let's talk about this backdrop that there is 
um, concern about how can you trust what you read in the pages of our journals? How can you trust anything in any journal? Um, and and uh, and what that means for for all of us in the sort of scientific biomedical enterprise. So you know that the the NIH has um, adopted uh, uh, positions related to data sharing. Um, um, as a part of their rigor and reproducibility and in science uh, initiatives. And so this is a requirement for data sharing. And, and in order to support the NIH's initiative in this area, we have uh, created, made it easier for authors to share their data sharing statements in their papers. Um, uh, we don't mandate data sharing. And that's because I think we are still in the midst of a conversation about what this actually means, right? Um, I think this is clearly a mandate. This is clearly something that is important, um, but uh, it is both an unfunded mandate at this point and one that doesn't recognize, I think, the nuance of what we mean when we're talking about data sharing. If we are talking about reproducibility, we probably want something more than just data. We like code or things to be able to reproduce a scientific finding. What types of data do we want to have available? Is it enough that everybody is sharing their data on their own platform, or should we all be trying to uh, put data together in the tags that actually make it useful into these large aggregators of data? Um, and I think the problem with just having this mandate is that it will potentially encourage lots of little small ways in which institutions can share data without acknowledging that for data to be usable, it needs a lot of other things. And, uh, and I think there's very little conversation about this right now. You have seen, uh, yes, uh, last week, Science announced that they would pay uh, for the deposition of data into Dryad for any author who's published in Science. I think that there, I think the challenge for the medical journals as we've started to think about this is that there's a variety of different types of data in the fields that publish with us. And whether there's a single uh, data repository that really uh, can accommodate all of that, I think is, is emerging. So we're paying close attention to this. I think we will want to, um, we will want to continue to promote uh, those things that eventually emerge as the way to do this, but I think this is a very dynamic time, which is why we don't at this point mandate data sharing, um, but we try to enable what the NIH has required. We're trying to keep pace with the latest developments in the field. You may have heard of ChatGPT. Um, uh, so, um, so when ChatGPT was introduced, we realized as we were publishing this that it had already been indexed in PubMed as an author several times. Um, so we took the position here that ChatGPT is a tool like many other tools. It will be an important tool in medicine as it will in publishing. Um, ChatGPT cannot fulfill the requirements of an author, cannot actually take responsibility for the work. So if you use ChatGPT or any other large language model, you need to tell us you've used it, you need to understand the limitations, and you, need, you are responsible for whatever that comes there. Other journals have taken different positions. So science said you cannot use this. So uh, they have taken a very strong position, and they're sort of in the midst of Lots of, as when I talked to the editor and chief there, of, you know, nobody thought Photoshop would be a threat to scientific validity. And yet we know that especially the basic science journals have really dealt with, oh, what, is, what does Photoshop mean? And, um, and so I think that we, we are, I don't think they're right or we're right. I think that this is an issue that we are going to have to think about its implications for for what people trust when they um, when they look at what we have in our um, what we publish on our pages, the things that I think we do know, I'm sure all of you. Well, I don't know what what you're doing with ChatGPT. You don't have to tell me. Um, but um, uh, I do think it does seem to be a very effective tool for making things that are hard to do in our everyday life a little bit easier. And one of the things that we have started, and so that means it probably will have a role if people will use it to create publications that they send to us. 
One of the things that I worry about is cause a little bit of hand wringing is whether people would use it to write peer review, for example. Uh, if people think that what I care about is two wonderful pages of like fluffy prose, as opposed to you know some bullet points of like why this is really the terrible paper or a great paper, you might do that. Um, uh, that would pose particular issues if somebody were actually entering text into, into a large language model, which would violate the terms of our use. There's so many things about how we think about plagiarism and how we think about valid citations and how we think about original work that, um, that a very powerful tool like this, I think, uh, uh, challenges uh, those of us in the publication uh, business and uh, we're we're writing a little bit more about this because I, I think that this will be important just as it chat GPT is important for how it will change how we practice this. We have tried as a journal to take positions on so to, to develop guidance on certain things um, because we publish uh, an, a, a manual of style. And uh, I think this has this plays an important role for, for many things. So this is um, standards for reporting of race and ethnicity in medical journals. This was uh, a process that our editors undertook before I started up at the journal, um, and uh, to basically uh, go through the guidance for how to report on race and ethnicity in medical studies. Um, this uh, in, after peer after uh, a, a literature review and assembling this document, it went open for comment from experts in the field as well as public comment. This is actually a pretty good document, and um, and I think has been used by many. If you're like me, who sits in the literature on race and ethnicity, you can think about all the critiques of this. But as a guidance for uh, journals who oftentimes have authors who are not thinking about the issues and reporting of race and ethnicity. It's actually quite a thoughtful document, uh, well cited. This is a dynamic area, as you know, and the National Academies just came out with a great report on uh, genetics and uh, using race and ethnicity and reporting of, of genetic studies uh, that I think will prompt changes. And the key here for us is that we always have to be willing to uh, keep this updated. And if some of you have read this um, or have even uh, tried to convince a JAMA editor that you want to write things one way and they tell you, well, that's not our style. Um, so uh, you know that this can be somewhat of a rigid document. My view is that these are not tablets that have come from the heavens. <laughs> these are living documents that have to be revised and have to keep pace. And I think we're really fortunate to have, uh, to, to be able to do this. And we'll, we're going to be spending a bit of time on several sections of this. One of the things that I'm really uh, uh, thrilled with is that um, Isa has, has joined us and is, is helping us with use of causal language, uh, which is part of our AMA manual of style, which I know is of interest to many of you, and will be, um, as we work through this process, I think, uh, a useful contribution. So, um, so let's talk about addressing the mistrust um, in science, that's what we've just been talking about. How can we trust what we read in our pages? <clears throat> A bigger issue is mistrust about science. So we publish, we, we do everything that we can to make sure that um, we have vetted uh, a paper that the authors have done that so that it can be reproduced if they can. And then there's the issue that uh, we see rising trends of just distrust about science itself. Uh, and um, this is an interview I did with uh, Dr. Fauci at the end of when he uh, retired about communicating science in a polarized era. I said, well, what should we be doing? And he said, you just have to keep with the science, play the science. Say it over and over again. Don't deviate from it. And there is something simple uh, about that, and I think in some ways right. I do think what it recognizes is that um, there there are um, uh, both there is both a a growing degree of um, mistrust about scientific findings, or said another way. There isn't the benefit of the doubt that just because something is published in JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine or someplace that that would be something we should pay attention to. Um, and then there's active uh, there's active disinformation out there. There are active forces that are seeking to discredit what comes out of these journals. And 
Um, it's easy for us because we are mostly talking to ourselves to not pay attention to that. Um, but I think I think the threat to the work that we do is still very real. Um, so this is work that uh, a trial that we published um, uh, earlier this year at the end of February, um, and a trial of ivermectin for uh, COVID-19. Uh, no, ivermectin does not work for treatment of COVID-19. Um, we published this trial. Um, so when you publish a trial of ivermectin at this point in the pandemic, you, you, you're met with one of two responses. Why in the world are you publishing a trial that we already know the results to? Ivermectin does not work for COVID-19. Or why in the world would you publish this trial that's so flawed and doesn't tell you all of the ways in which you're failing to see why ivermectin works for COVID-19? Um, which I get those letters all the time. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, we published this trial because one of the critiques of the existing literature um, amongst people who are interested in ivermectin is that we haven't tested high enough doses, we haven't tested long enough duration, and this trial does exactly that. Higher dose and longer duration, and uh, still it, there's no evidence that it works. We published this alongside an editorial that basically said, um, when uh, do we have clinical equipoise? Um, uh, how much, uh, how should we think about areas that have very active, uh, um, very active uh, skepticism of the existing literature um, and, and raise a number of questions. And when do we say that the cost to patients, the cost to research communities, the cost to funders, the cost to all of us to do one more study to address one more when the overall body of work really suggests that there is no place for this uh, particular um, therapeutic um, it, uh, starts to become subtle science. And so it's a very thoughtful um, editorial here um, written uh, by Alex London at, at Pitt. Um, we also wrote an editor's note with this that basically said, let's not, let's not kid each other. Like just because we published this and just because these scientists did a great trial doesn't mean we're going to convince anybody who thinks that they ivermectin works that it doesn't work, right? And so if we want to do that, that actually requires a whole different set of ways of communicating about this finding or about this work. And the question is, what is the role of a, of a traditional medical journal? Is it enough to say, look, this is the trial, it's clear, it doesn't work, or should there be more with other partners if we can't do it on our own to start to see how we can communicate in a way that reaches um, uh, more people who might be more skeptical. And the reason I think to think about this more specifically is because those groups that are actively engaged in disinformation are actively engaged in disinformation. And if those of us who are interested in accurate the communication of accurate scientific information, we have to engage a little bit more, I think, in the hand-to-hand -hand combat that's required to do this. The question is how? The people who write about misinformation um, write about three strategies uh, to, um, to help uh, combat misinformation and misinformation. The first is promoting accurate scientific information. Right, so that starts with our editorial and peer review process. Starts with making sure we are doing everything possible in partnership with authors to make sure that we're accurately presenting findings. On a platform like ours, it means that we're trying to communicate in all the channels we have: podcasts, videos, infographics, graphics, stuff, all sorts of things to get information out there. And one of the things that I'm interested in is the language we use, the words we use. How do we make sure that we are using those in a way that might um, appeal to, uh, to different audiences? Because I think there is a tendency for us to continue to speak to ourselves and use the same type of language, as opposed to thinking about how you present information that somebody who doesn't come at it with that same preconceived idea that our publication means it's going to be valid. Um, and so we will be experimenting a little bit more with how to promote accurate <laughs> There's a lot that's been written now about pre-bunking, and I think uh, Scientific American had a nice article on pre-bunking. Uh, pre-bunking is sort of anticipating where the counter narratives are going to be and using tools to help uh, uh, build skills um, about uh, to sort of avoid somebody falling into the trap of, of some, some usually a common recurrent theme in, in the disinformation 
uh, and, and things. Um, here we're, we're thinking a lot about how we build skills or how we at least talk about what does uh, communication mean in clinical practice. We know that literacy skills, numeracy skills are sort of waning. We also are not really sure that clinicians caring for patients always have the same sets of skills to think about how to communicate what they read to the patient who's sitting in front of them. And one of our um, associate editors, Andy Cola, is really thinking a lot about uh, scientific communication, but really uh, about how clinicians communicate information to their patients. Um, and I think this falls in that category of building skills um, and uh, doing that in anticipation there. The other thing that I think we do will do more of, and I feel really strongly about, is that it is the responsibility of authors when they submit papers, I think, to convey in their discussion uh, something that really puts a scientific finding in context, and not just in scientific context, but sometimes in the context of the greater societal uh, conversations that are happening. And if it's not appropriate for that to happen in the discussion section for an author, that's why we use editorials quite a bit to sort of set that context around to sort of give people an idea. And I think we cannot put our heads in the sand and just believe we published it, science is out there, we're going to leave it to others to figure out. We do a lot more communicating about the ways in which one might think about this in terms of broader And then the last category is debunking or sort of actively going after false information. I think the challenge here for a scientific publication, of course, is that, um, is that when is science settled science, right? Um, is that as science is emerging, um, you want to be publishing all sides of a conversation. You want to be uh, putting things out there that might be hypothesis generating, even most of in the scientific community don't agree. Um, uh, but the question is, at what point are we really in the land of settled science, where it is the role of, of, of those of us who communicate about science to actually call things that are false, false. All right, so my final area that I'm talking about is sort of the broader conversation about the issues facing science and medicine. And I think, uh, I think hopefully you'll all agree that I think in whatever areas we're working in, there are a lot of, there's a lot of self-reflection going on. In some cases, there's a lot of existential crisis and of what, of what we're facing in each of these areas. And I think uh, that is true for publishing. And I think because publishing sits at the intersection of all of these, we're a part of the, the larger conversations that are going on here. Just to remind you what JAMA looks like, we had a discussion last night about who's still getting this in print in their houses and who's reading it online. Um, I like to show this because it does uh, sort of give you a sense of the organization of JAMA and how we think about things. Our primary job in the journal is to publish original research. That's the left-hand column. We publish full research articles and research letters. We think about the middle column as the context around the scientific finding, the opinions. Uh, the opinions are the editorials, the things that tell us about the larger con uh, uh, conduct of medicine, about putting the scientific finding in context. And then the last column is clinical reviews and education. And this is a really important column because Really, um, uh, we have a, a, a massive uh, clinical readership, so not clinician scientists, but clinicians. And I think this is a this is what makes the platform at JAMA a very attractive one for many authors to publish in. Is that uh, is that um, that the large clinical platform, the platform of, of you know the clinicians using the, the journal, I think it is what's really powerful. And that last section is really where we do a lot of clinical reviews and education, in, including some some patient education. So how do we, how uh, in these larger conversations, how does what we do uh, have an impact on that? Well, we choose to publish things uh, that we think are important for those topical issues. And you'll see here Don Berwick's um, viewpoint on uh, solving Lucrum, the existential threat to breed, a breed in US healthcare, which is probably one of our most widely read viewpoints this year. If you haven't read it already, I really urge you to do so. It's uh, it, it really speaks to, it really tapped into, I think, uh, from a variety of different perspectives, something that, uh, that people are really experiencing. So we want to publish uh, the so, um, viewpoints that come to us, 
We also think that we can have an impact not just by waiting for things to come in, but actually concentrating things that we think are particularly important and uh, might be uh, might uh, sometimes be missed in a larger conversation. We do that sometimes by doing this. We've done two theme issues this year, uh, one highlighting uh, firearms and violence and one on reproductive uh, on healthcare access and reproductive rights. Um, the goal of our journal is still to lead first with the science. So in each of these areas, there are lots of views written, but we were really quite intent on publishing science that would be relevant to this, of giving numbers to people who are trying to understand the implications on the right of the Supreme Court decision. This is one that I think editors spend a lot of time thinking about what's our role and do we want to step into a political controversy? In this one, it was very clear, at least to me, um, that you know, the criminalization of a, an evidence-based procedure was an important one for us to write about, and not from the perspective of politics, but from the perspective of all the clinicians who now have to think differently about what they prescribe, what happens in the ICU, what happens in the ER, can you give uh, you know, the rheumatology drugs? And so this is very much written from our lens, like who we think our readers are, and taking on an issue that, um, that really is, uh, I think, ha has had a, ha had a major impact on uh, how we think about uh, the care of patients and the ways physicians uh, think about decisions that they need to make to, to do the best for their patients. Um, it, it's a it's a cha it's challenging to know when to enter into these. I'd love to have a discussion about with others of you about about how. But I think for and I think we only do these selectively. Uh, but I think they they can be important and and it is a platform that does get attention because of that. Um, another way in which we, we thought about the role of, of the journal, not just waiting for papers to come in, but actually to uh, drive key conversations is the conversations we're having right now about uh, the clinical trials enterprise, right? Um, we have a massive and massively expensive clinical trial enterprise that I think we saw during the pandemic and we knew before uh, that we oftentimes spend a lot of money that don't get results quickly enough, don't have results that really speak to my decision I'm making for the patient in front of me. And the question is, uh, what aspects of our trial enterprise can, can be fixed and how can they be fixed? And so this is the first time we'll be hosting a, a JAMA Summit in person in Chicago um, with uh, thought leaders in this, in this area. And uh, this is something that I hope will be an annual, uh, an annual thing and something that we can do to really promote bringing people together on a timely issue facing uh, science or medicine in order to drive a sort of key aspects of that conversation. So more to come and would love to hear from you all. I know you do a lot of bringing people together. Would love to hear from you all what you think those important issues are. The issue of equity is something that uh, has uh, been an issue we have wrestled with for a long time, as are the academic centers and society in, in general. Um, but for me, the issues of equity in publishing have to do with the fundamental of questions of who has access to read our articles, who has access to publish, and how do we decide what and who ends up on the pages of JAMA. And uh, these are not easy issues. Um, and you'll see that some of the issues are, uh, about uh, that we took on public access, uh, some of uh, are related exactly to number one and number two. The issues of how do we decide what to publish and who to publish, I think is a, is a challenging one uh, because there is a relentless pace of weekly publishing that it's very easy to stick with the same groups you always know. And the question is, how do you make sure that you are not missing voices and how do we make sure we're not amplifying things that, uh, that uh, really should be, should be amplified the best that we can uh, for the care of our patients. Um, and some of that for us is just broadening the people who are parts of our team as either editors, reviewers, or on our publishing team. And so you'll see us doing much more actively in this space. I would say this is an issue not unique to JAMA, um, even though JAMA has had a high profile event uh, last year uh, related to this. These are issues that really are uh, critical ones. And because there is a sense in which journals are gatekeepers to a lot of what gets out there. It's a crucial one if we care about equity in any of the
This is one that I just like to highlight is sort of the soul searching that's happening amongst journals. And, uh, um, and uh, this is the intersection of uh, uh, open access. We all like that. Things should be openly available. It usually means a fee to you. And when a fee to an author aligns with a fee to the publisher, so your, your interest in publishing more papers align with the publisher's interest in making more money, um, what you have is this rapid rise of what uh, Dr. Ianides has described here as mega journals. And what you see here, this is probably one of the, a big distorting force in journals right now, is that you see these journals publishing just an extraordinary uh, number of papers a year. Um, I am not saying that uh, all of these journals are, um, that one should be skeptical about all of these journals. Many of these are really high quality journals, scientific report. Plus one, for example. Several of these, when this article was published, actually that day, not because of this article, but coincidentally, um, several of the MDPI journals were actually lost their impact factor. They were viewed as predatory journals. Um, but you can see that this, this effect has happened fairly quickly. Uh, the scale of this is fairly large. One of the things that's pointed out here in this um, in this article is that one of the reasons that some of these journals get taken off is that they they have this extraordinary self citation rate. Um, like I think with animals, it's like like a twenty five percent self citation rate. So you can see that they are like the sole controllers of every view in in the medical literature in that in the scientific literature in that field. And I think this is one that we will all be uh, wrestling with a little bit more over time. So let me final reflections then, and hopefully we can have some time for conversation. So this is a dynamic time for science and medicine, as it is for medical publishing. We have new technologies that need to focus on equity, and then the pace of publishing are all offers significant opportunities as well as challenges. Trust and mistrust in science and about science are growing issues, and then they will require rethinking on the ways in which all of us will need to address them. And medical journals, I think, must be an active force in driving these conversations as they're important to the future of science and the medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, we have time for, for questions. Oh, and, and if anyone online has questions, please uh, chime in. I, I can get us. Oh, Peter. Wonderful talk. Thank you. I'm curious a little bit to get your attitude about um, your opinion about authorship and conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that comes up at Harvard, I'm going to put it here, is that um, there's quite a strict rule about authorship if you're involved in the company. And, and in fact, you can't be a senior author if you're actively involved in the company. You can be in the paper. Uh, but you can't. You can be in the list of authors, but you can't be a senior author, which has struck me as being. I mean, I would. I've always made the argument that, in fact, if in some way you're influencing that data, you should be in a very prominent role. It turns out that data is not accurate. Uh, you should be held accountable. In no way, and that that's certainly facilitated by being at a prominent public role in the, in the manuscript. But um, what is Jamis? So, you know, what's your personal opinion about this? Yes, so the question is uh, the role of author authorship and conflicts of interest and uh, and the need to take people who who uh, might be actively involved in a study but have a have a financial interest in that and oftentimes being uh, required to not be on that paper or right? bury them in a, in a less influential place yeah. even if they were in fact the driver of the work. Yeah. So um, so I have to, so let me just say, historically, um, JAMA has had a very serious conflict. Um, and I think it is rooted in the right principles. And I think with most things that are complicated, I sort of fall back on what the first principles are. Um, and so, so I agree in the spirit of those. I will say for me personally, in the nine months I've been editor in chief, it's come up to me very quickly about why we have to have flexibility on this. So I have several clinical reviews of people who I don't want to actually read what their reviews are about because the people I do want to read their reviews have consulted for some company. 
right? And I think um, our job as editors, my view, is to have the best people writing those and then to be able to vet whether there is bias in uh, whether their conflict poses substantial enough bias that I don't have confidence for. And I have to do that through peer review, through my own reading of that. And I don't think it, we should have, I, I don't, I think just saying a conflict means you can't do something does not make sense. And your example, so, so yeah, so what would, what would we ideally like? The people who have control of the data, we want, should have responsibility for that as a senior author. I'll also tell you, we filmed this just recently, had a manuscript where it's pretty clear that they know that that's what I think. So they put two academics on, and it's an entire industry sponsored paper, right? And so they put them and bookended them. And so I think these simple rules, if somebody's intent on, um, on influencing a system, they will figure out how to get around all those rules. And I think our job, it's harder to do, is to say, well, what's really happening here? Who really has control over this? Data? Who really wrote this paper? And, and then to stick with that and not have Simple. That, that's what I've come down to, but it's it's hard to do. So, uh, cardiology is, I mean, we, we particularly in interventional cardiology have the full spectrum of irony here. I mean, we have a, we have a CRO that runs a major meeting that has inordinate influence over new device, uh, the, the publications of new devices that I think is the, mo the most gratuitous conflict, that, you know, in American medicine. And then we have, you know, much more, much stricter rules for other influential journals and there's sort of no conversation around you know where the right echo plays. Yeah, I think I think we have to have those conversations because like for me, I want to know that an author has control of the data, they have the control over the analysis, yeah. that they're standing behind it. That's the author I want. If they if they also have a financial interest, I want to understand that and I want to be able to assess whether that interest has somehow influenced the paper or not, right? And I think all these other rules sometimes you're going to game them, you're going to game them, right? <laughs> There's more questions. Arthur. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I was curious to hear more about the expedited review process that Gemma has been, and whether there are specific strategies that seem to be more effective in this setting that have not worked otherwise for this reviewer selection, or how exactly that one must turn around and happen. Yeah, so it turns out that, that on the publishing side, it, um, the, the publishers are able to actually do the mechanics of publishing an article that we've accepted pretty quickly now. And they're, they're, they're all in favor of doing this. The challenge of, so when you say four weeks from submission, it, it really means can you bring reviewers to the table who are going to review quickly and high quality, and you have an editor that can quickly synthesize those reviews to make a decision on the paper. Can you work with an author to get a review back, to, to get a revision back, and then do it? That, that's, what, that's what it really means, right? Because the publishing side, the publisher are like, yeah, we can do it, don't worry. Um, so, and I think that, that requires, uh, it requires experienced editors, it requires uh, reviewers that we know we can go to and trust will get reviews back. And, um, and, and, to be frank, it requires a good triage process up front. We're not going to accept everything into this pathway, but that, that's what it requires. It means that every step that sometimes there's a lag that we can figure out how to do, and that's that's just experience and, and being able to work with authors and to do more active communication. The way I think about this is there's, there's oftentimes this antagonistic view of journals and authors. It's like, you're trying to get your paper in, I'm trying to send it out, and that's what we're doing. But really, once we have a paper that we're trying to get to publication, like we should be partners to try to do that, right? You should be you should be actively interested. We don't want to publish something that we're all going to be embarrassed by down the road. So, like, we should be working together to do that, and that requires a lot more phone calls, talking, and back and forth to get it done. The other thing we've done, frankly, not just in our Academic Express, which would try to make the other process sort of resemble that and be a little bit quicker to really encourage more back and forth on thinking about what's really important in this paper that needs to be revised. Um, not, not necessarily um, all of the many things that all of us would have done differently from the outset, but what, what's really important. If the paper's important to get out there, what's really important for the author to do to improve that paper? And that requires a lot of experience editors and a lot more communication. Thank you. That was just really, really a terrific, terrific talk. Um, 
I think that you know so many people in here in this room are peer reviewers, and I, there's been a conversation about, and it rests on volunteer time, and yes. much conversation about whether or not there should be professional review, paid review, and I imagine at a journal like JAMA, and particularly as you go down the network where more and more papers are being reviewed, and maybe not at the same level of, of skill as a big JAMA is, what are your thoughts on professional review, paid review? Can the system continue to sustain on volunteers? Yeah, so let me just start with the last one first. So I'm really concerned about the system. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about the system because you are experienced enough to know what you're going to review and what you're not going to review, to know where to use your time and how it fits in your overall scope. I'm sure you've made those decisions. I go to talks all the time where I'm with like junior faculty. They're, the volume of reviews that they're doing is like, it's crazy. And then when I ask them, like, has anyone ever told you how to do a review? And they're like, well, no, not really. And so they're not as good as you when doing a review. They are not as efficient. They're not. And so when you look at that rise in the mega journals and you look at rise in publications, like I'm worried the overall weight of peer review is just not sustainable uh, when you look just at that volume. And I think it is it is inequitable, and I think we're really leaning on lots of people who are not actually fulfilling the spirit of peer review because we're we're just getting anybody to do this, right, at this point, too, including people who might be good in a field but not experience it as review. Um, so what's the solution? I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I will say we, so we publish one open access journal. The JAMA Network Open publishes 2,000 papers a year, has a hard time getting papers. They have elevated on their masthead distinguished reviewers. So they are not paying them, but they're recognizing these are people who are essential to our process as journal editors. They're doing a large volume of review. And I think there's a way in which people who do a lot of reviews um, who do that because of a, a feeling of commitment about time. So I, I think that there, there is that. I worry a little bit about professional reviews. Well, I worry about professional reviews. I think we, I think there are models one could imagine um, paying reviewers. Um, I don't know how it fits in all of the things related to open access and public access, which really are exploding the volume of publications at the same time. And I, I don't, I just don't know. I, I think there are ways of recognizing that there's value to people who do a lot of reviews. And I also know that what I worry about with professional reviews is that we then get a small group of voices who are telling us what's important for work. And I learned so much from like the peer reviewer we have never had as a peer reviewer telling me who's the expert in that paper who's like, yeah, that's a great paper. Mm -hmm. we have one question online. So you just hold that. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm just wondering uh, with the expansion uh, in terms of the number of journals that are available to publish in, I, I think there, there's this risk, this tension of quality control uh, in terms of, uh, especially some of the journals you listed there. And I'm wondering if you think that preprints, you know, the upside clearly is that we can get information out faster. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering how you think about, it, you know, uh, just another venue for more articles to come out in that maybe isn't going through that uh, peer review mechanism and the risk for misinformation. Uh, via preprint servers, which seem to come out a little bit during the pandemic. Yeah, so I think I I do think people have written about the concerns for misinformation that came out with preprints. I am I'm and it's a risk. I think it is a it's small relative to uh, the the volume that came out on preprint servers, and I think a lot of good that came out to getting scientific information out there. I think misinformation that's going to happen can happen through so many platforms that like, at least if I have a scientific publication there on a preprint server, that's better to me than the press release that somebody issued or the tweet that somebody issued or whatever. And so I, I don't, I'm not as down on preprints as, as a lot of people are. I just worry, what I worry about preprints is our case example now is during a time of the pandemic when all the smartest people in the world were home, like reading stuff on preprint servers and commenting, and that's not the reality of how it will be going forward. So I don't know that they, that 
that the good example of preprints and lots of people crowdsourcing how that model should be improved is the steady state for preprints because I don't think I don't think everyone's as engaged in the same way. So, but I'm not down on preprints. Thank you. We'll take a few more, a couple more minutes if it's okay. We're we're already over time. There's one question online uh, that says, thank you for the great insights. For trainees and junior people in the room, are there opportunities to look under the hood of the publication process with a fellowship? It's like this was planted. <laughs> <laughs> was it? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly where we want to be going. So part of uh, uh, part of what we want to be doing, I, I so for me anyway, this was always a sort of a mystifying thing, you know, what happens when things go into to, uh, publication. And I have to say, for me, looking to hire, as you all are in the business also of hiring, you know, good talent, you realize there, there are fewer people who have like a depth of experience in, in publishing. And so what we want to do is both um, give people more tools uh, to be reviewers and uh, and then all of our journals basically within the next year will be expanding fellowship programs where you can spend three months or up to a year, uh, not full time, but some may be full time, but mostly not full time, but being part of our editorial team. Um, I think just in the same way, you know, being an early career grant reviewer helps you to understand the grant process and write grants better. I think understanding how we think in an editor in a manuscript meeting about a, a manuscript will help people both to understand what's a good peer review, understand what it is to, to go through a, a process of submitting a paper to, to uh, journals. And I do think this is the opportunity we have across a network is to, is to put out things you know, through video and stuff like that, as well as to do these types of fellowships uh, to make this available to more people. Thank you, Kirsten. That was uh, such a treat, as always. Lots of, lots of food for thought. We have a memento um, for you. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we, we select one person every year to give this really important talk to us, and we have some great plaque uh, to commemorate your selection as our visiting professor for the Smith Center of Athletics Research. Thank you. Oh, wow. Not the business to make a world meet, to be meeting some of you individually, but maybe most importantly at noon today, there will be an opportunity to sit down for all the trainees and, and, and junior folks who want to sit down with her for an hour to be able to, to, to learn more from her, to be able to receive some mentorship from her. I'll say that that I was telling her last night that, that I was very influenced as a trainee sitting in a lecture that she was on a panel like the one you're going to get at noon today. And it's, it's Jen and I were both in that room and we both remember vividly the wisdom that she enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you.